join Forum IS Academy, trusted by hundreds of toppers, including IS Rank 1 Shruti Sharma. Hello and welcome to Forum IAS. Today is 6th March 2023. These are all the articles which we are going to discuss today. And one more bonus is waiting for you. We are going to discuss four questions from previous year prelims. That too from 2016 and 2015. This discussion will be carried out at the end of the video. Stay tuned till the end of the video. Now let's jump into the first article of the day. The first article is about Great Indian Bustard. Why this is in news? Because the Central Electricity Authority, they have come up with new regulations which says that power lines which have capacity below 33 kilovolt they only need to go underground and if it is above 33 kilo volt, they can be above ground. So what happens is these great Indian bustards, they collide with this above ground power lines and they die. die right? So this is leading to reduction of population of the great Indian bustard. So, the activists are saying that this particular norm will hinder the efforts to make the region safe for the Great Indian Bustard. Currently, this Great Indian Bustard is in critically endangered status according to the IUCN Red List. We will see more facts about Great Indian Bustard which is popularly called as Jibi. Okay, I will also share some interesting facts with you. Uh, stay tuned. So, the conservationists, they are saying that in actuality, at the present time, only less than 150 members of this GB remain. So, as a result of that, to conserve this species, environmentalists, they approach the Supreme Court. So, as a result of this case, Supreme Court ruled that low voltage power lines should go underground in the priority and potential habitats of Great Indian Bustard. This is especially in Thar Desert and the Kutch region. Here, Supreme Court ordered the low voltage power lines to go underground. So, Central Electricity Authority's new norm bypasses this particular order and if this is implemented, already this species is critically endangered and it would go extinct. There are chances of extinction. Then this species will become the second major species to go extinct after cheetah in the post-independent India. So recently cheetah was reintroduced in India. We bought an uh, African cheetah to be reintroduced in India. As a result, we are facing many challenges to rehabilitate, to make the cheetahs adapt to the new environment, right? So, better thing to do is to prevent the extinction. Initially, before peacock was chosen as the national bird of India, this jibi was proposed to become a national bird of India, but later this particular proposal was dropped. Okay, so we will see some facts about this great Indian bustard. This is a beautiful illustration of great Indian bustard. This is very important from prelims point of view. There is a convention called Convention on Migratory Species. This is called CMS Convention. So, the Conference of Parties, that is the Annual 
convention of this particular CMS conference of parties sorry conference of parties so this took place in Gandhi Nagar in 2022 and for this conference of parties the mascot was GB. So we all know that UPSC has a tendency to ask questions from past one year, two year, three year current affairs also. In that context this GB becomes very important. So the great Indian bustard it is the state bird of Rajasthan and historically in western India this particular bird was present and it spanned 11 states and it was even found in the parts of Pakistan. But now most of the population of this species is confined to Rajasthan and Gujarat but some a minuscule population is also found in Maharashtra and Andhra Pradesh also. But majority population is present in Rajasthan and Gujarat and the busters they inhabit grasslands. This is also very important in statement questions they might ask about this. What is the preferable habitat for busters? They prefer flat open landscape and that too the size of grass should not be very tall than them. And this jibby it grows up to a height of 1 meter. Okay. It is not that big of a bird also. And what are the threats? Hunting which is still prevalent in Pakistan. Thankfully this is not happening in India. Poaching outside protected areas. Collisions with high tension electric wires. Fast moving vehicles and dogs. So these are all the major threats. That is direct threats. The indirect threat is habitat loss because of expanding agriculture, irrigation, roads, mining, industrialization. These grasslands which are very suitable, they are being encroached upon. They are used for agriculture. They are used for industrialization. So there is habitat loss. And this species is listed in the schedule 1. Now from this you can understand the degree of protection. It is placed on par with species like tiger and elephants. And this is critically endangered in the IUCN red list which we have already discussed. Alright and extra things are about this CMS and this species was the mascot for this CMS conference of parties held in 2022. I will move on to the next article. This is a very interesting article given the context of recently concluded G20 foreign ministers meeting, G20 finance ministers meeting and quad foreign ministers meeting. So India has successfully organized these meetings and as a result it is riding on a geopolitical high. Why? Because there is a surge in reputation and stature of India as a country. Why India has gained prominence? The author is giving the following reasons. Because of the strong foundation. For the past 70 years, we were uh, taking the policy of NAM, non-alignment movement. We were largely neutral. We were not hostile. So this laid the groundwork for present stature of India. Next is the economic might and military might. Obviously now we are the most populous country in the world. So we are a big market and this goes to prove the economic might of India and also the military might because India has the fourth largest army. So, it is a significant player in the global as well as regional security and aggressively rising China. So, in the context of rising China, other countries especially the West sees India to be a much reliable partner compared to China. So, these are all the reasons why India has gained stature and prominence in the global arena. 
So, our external affairs minister, Mr. S. Jai Shankar, in his book, he has uh, said that uh, advancing national interest by identifying and exploiting opportunities created by global contradiction. That should be the policy of India. So, in short, he is saying that we have to be able to play both the sides. What is this both the sides? You should be counterbalancing beautifully and you should take only national interest to the forefront. In uh, international relations, bilateral relations, multilateral relations, only one thing matters and that is national interest. National interest. That is what our external affairs minister also thinks. So, he says that advancing national interest by exploiting the contradictions. So, what it means is we have to be adept at playing both sides which is seen here because India had chaired both the West led G20 and China centered SEO. This is what playing both sides mean. You are siding with the West also and you are also balancing China. So, this is what is advancing national interest by playing both sides means. And India is also taking a place in global high table because of G20. And it is also emerging as the leader of global south because of its prominence in organization like SEO. What is global south? Global south is the developing countries and least developed countries. Which is the LDC. So, India is emerging as a global leader in the global south as as well as it is also emerging as a leader in the global high table. And in Ukraine war, India alienated neither side. India didn't take side of the West, nor did it take the side of Russia. So, this is what playing both sides means. India is taking interest in organization like Quad and it is also taking interest in organization like BRICS and SCO. We know about Quad, right? Quad is a four member informal organization consisting of US, India, Japan and Australia. So, this is to counterbalance China. If we see BRICS, SCO and all, China is a prominent player. So, these things India did in 2023. This way India played both the sides. That is what the author explains what it means to play both the sides. But why is India doing that? In the end, what does India want? India wanted a seat at the global high table, which means permanent seat in, in UNSC. But this is not in sight. So, India is highlighting the dysfunctionality of UNSC. So, it is saying that UNSC, United Nations Security Council, has become ineffective and there needs to be inclusive and flexible forums like G20. Because India thinks its permanent seat in UNSC is far, it is saying that actually, you know what? UNSC is not very functional and we need more bodies like G20. That way India is playing. And this recently concluded G20 finance and foreign minister meeting. Though there was no joint statement, yet it was a success because it brought into consensus the US Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. Actually, we can't say that to be a consensus. At least India tried to bring them together for the first time since the war. And second thing is, most of the forum, they were not able to bring together the warring parties, that is the West and Russia. But India succeeded in doing that. 
so what why does india do that because india wants to be in the global high table that is why india is doing all these things so india is projecting global south uh, india may not have the interest of global south it may not really care it might care it may not really care but india has understood how to play the global south uh, argument in its favor how to use this argument in order to attain power and status china has been using this strategy so india is also getting very skillful at playing this global south card but there is to be caution because fall in line and you will be forgotten if we are going to fall in line in all the issues you will be soon forgotten you have to make your mark right so new delhi is understanding that their ability to carefully balance global fault lines that will increase its utility so other countries will trust india to manage these kind of fault lines and if the other countries want india to manage global fault lines then india can use other countries to gain a seat in unsc so india has to play carefully at the same time it should not fall in line too often it should be independent in, in its assertion also now what are the challenges challenges are like the g20 presidency as well as sco presidency they are approximately for one year and they will end by the end of 2023 and china is projecting itself as the leader of global south and it won't let new delhi to take over this position it will have it will put up a tough fight so we also have to deal with that and uh, for how long can we balance both sides at one point you have to take stand that is a risk in this playing both sides argument and sometimes what happens diplomatic highs are used in domestic political ends instead of using this we really have to go for long term goals that is to make india a prominent player in global politics so if we are very much aware of these challenges india is in a better position to ride on this diplomatic high so to summarize this the author is saying that india has been playing a very good neutral role and it is also gaining prominence in the global politics but it comes with its own challenges and we need to be aware of this challenges so that this success doesn't go to waste so that is what is the summary of this article this is very useful for gs2 certainly there might be a question related to this in the upcoming mains so kindly note take note of this article moving on to the next article it is about bio computers so in johns hopkins university they are coming up with a new area of research called as organoid intelligence and using this they are creating bio computers now what is bio computer bio computer is nothing but brain cultures which are grown in lab and they are connected to real world sensors and input output devices like our brain is connected to input output device that is our eyes our ears our skin right so here what they are doing is they are growing the brain they are growing the organoids in lab and we are connecting it to input output devices this this is called as bio computer so why we are doing this we want to understand the biological basis of human cognition learning and various neurological disorders that is we want to know how human beings learn how the brain functions what are all the different neurological disorders so this will help in understanding all those things so what is the underlying premise is see the brain organoids they are mini brains so i'll show you the picture of these organoids so these this is the culture of organoids which are which is basically lab grown brain right so these are the 3d culture of brain tissue and how this is done using human stem cells 
so these human stem cells are undergoing a 3d culture and then brain organoids are developed so what is the challenge here challenge is that we are going growing this small brain organoids but it requires blood circulation which is not there in this and there has to be sensory inputs not just brain is sufficient it has to have some input some output then only we can understand what is going on inside if we simply develop this organoid what is the use so that is the challenge with this bio computer then how this is studied so what happens is this brain organoid is nested in the rat brain so they transplant this organoid to rat brain so what happens when it is placed in rat brain there is circulating blood and as a result the neurons in this uh, brain organoid they become active but the problem with studying uh, the effects of drugs so that is not properly undertaken in this transplanted brain cells into rats that becomes difficult so we need to have human relevant systems so though we are uh, surpassing this challenge by implanting this organoid into rat brain we still need to develop a human relevant system in that context only we are developing the bio computer that is brain organoid is com is combined with modern computing methods so there is also plan to couple the organoid with machine learning so what happens is you would have seen in uh, movies and all there are several so if assume this is the human brain this is the skull so several electrodes are inserted right you would have seen it in the movie so similarly they are planning to insert electrodes to this brain culture and they are using they are going to use machine learning to understand how the brain works so what will be the effect of this so the firing patterns of the neurons they can even give stimuli that is if electrodes are connected then stimuli can be uh, given in the form of electric shocks and then they can study how the neurons get fired so we can see how the brain responds to external stimuli and that is possible by connecting electrodes with the brain so another promising thing that can happen in this regard is there are some brain disorders like uh, parkinson's disease there is alzheimer so what happens is if we can compare normal brain that is healthy brain and patient derived organoids then we can understand what happens in this and we can better develop diagnostic systems we can de better develop treatments for these kind of neurological disorders also so basically this article talks about organoids with input output devices that is bio computer and it can be used to understand brain functioning it is as simple as that and this this is the brain culture moving on to the next article it is about an updated framework to protect marine life in the high seas so already we have discussed about territorial waters right territorial water exclusive economic zone that is e e z so we have studied about all this in our previous discussions now the region beyond this e e z so this say this is the coastline of india up to 12 nautical mile it is territorial water from there till 200 nautical mile it is the e e z right so beyond this whatever region is there that region is the high sea high sea so basically there is no um, 
comprehensive framework to deal with biodiversity in the high sea but now it has come about after 20 years of discussion for the first time un members have agreed on a unified treaty to protect biodiversity in the high seas now i have explained already what is the high sea and what is the development in this regard is so high sea it is nearly half the planet's surface we already know majority of earth's surface is covered with water and of this the high seas cover nearly half the planet's surface and through this new framework a new body will be established and it will manage the conservation of ocean life and it will also establish marine protected areas in the high seas so far marine protected areas are there in the territorial waters or in the eez if such a body comes into place they will also announce protected areas in high seas so earlier we also saw in a discussion about UN Biodiversity Conference's pledge to protect 30% of planet's water and land, right? So this particular initiative will help in achieving this pledge. And this body will mandate environmental impact assessment for commercial activities in the oceans. So in many oceans like in Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean and all, PMN that is polymetallic nodules, they are found. Okay, so in order to explore this, we have to go into the high seas. So if a body is there, it will oversee whether exploration of this PMN will pollute the high seas. So before conducting an exploration, this new body will mandate a EIA that is the Environmental Impact Assessment. And so this treaty, it applies for high seas, right? So it can also integrate with different regional treaties so that the entirety of oceans would be protected. So we will see the further developments in this regard. But this is a very important news in the history of mankind itself. Going on to the last article of the day, it is Sri Lankan government's proposal to provide license to Indian fishermen to enter Sri Lankan waters. So this is being opposed by Sri Lankan fishermen. So the problem with this is the bottom trawlers. So these are called bottom trawlers. So, see, they, they just trawl the bottom of the ocean floor and through these giant nets, they carry whatever comes in their way. Now, Indian boats, nearly 5,000 trawlers go every day into Sri Lankan waters. So, because of that, Sri Lankan fishermen feel that their livelihood is being affected. So, this trawler is a giant net. Even if there is a small fishing boat of Sri Lankan fishermen, their net, their boat and all will, will get cut because of this giant net. But the problem is that if 5000 trawlers are coming every day into Sri Lankan waters, it is becoming heavy for Sri Lankan Navy to monitor this. So, Sri Lankan government has come with this proposal that licenses will be given for these trawlers so we can properly regulate these trawlers. But Sri Lankan fishermen, so who are from the northern area, this is the Tamil dominated area of Sri Lanka and they were most affected by the Sri Lankan civil war. Right. So they are saying that already we are coming from a very low point. Now only we are gaining food. And in this context, if there are these kind of trawlers from India, it will severely affect the fisheries well. If all the fish is caught by these trawlers, what will be left for Sri Lankan fishermen? That is the problem. But Sri Lankan government is doing it from a regulation point of view and they also want to have proper bilateral relations uh, an amicable relation with India. So that is the problem here. 
that is what is discussed in this article and from geography point of view you have to concentrate on gulf of mannar and this small water body it is called as the park strait so park strait this is the small water body which is between india and sri lanka so that is it for the articles we will move to the questions so this was asked in prelims 2016 regarding the taxation system of krishna deva the ruler of vijayanagar consider the following statements the tax rate on land was fixed depending on the quality of the land two private owners of workshops paid an industry tax which of the statements given above is or are correct a one only b two only c both one and two d neither one nor two so both these statements are correct so this is nothing but a professional tax answer is c moving to the next question this was also asked in prelims 2016 which one of the following books of ancient india has the love story of the son of the founder of sunga dynasty a swapna vasavadatta b malavika agnimitra c meghadoota d ratnavali so actually all these books are written by kalidas so how to arrive at the answer so son of the founder of the sunga dynasty so he must also be a sunga ruler right so the founder of sunga dynasty who was that it was pushyamitra sunga his son was agnimitra sunga so his name is there in this option malavika agnimitra malavika agnimitra so b is the correct answer next this question was asked in prelims 2015 so i have put in this question uh, in the context of, of our discussion about sri lanka with reference to dugong a mammal found in india which of the following statements is or are correct it is a herbivorous marine animal it is found along the entire coast of india it is given legal protection under schedule 1 of wildlife protection act 1972 select the correct answer using the code given below a 1 and 2 b 2 only c 1 and 3 d 3 only c we might not know the legal protection because there are number of species in schedule 1 but it is a herbivorous marine animal it is otherwise called as sea cow so it is a herbivorous marine animal it is found along the entire coast of india this is wrong it is found in gulf of mannar which we saw earlier gulf of mannar andaman and nicobar and gulf of kutch so it is not found along the entire coast of india with this we will try to eliminate so two should not come right so we will eliminate this now only these two options are present we already know one is correct so the answer is c 1 and 3 so dugong is there in the first schedule of wildlife protection act only last question of the day when the reserve bank of india redu reduces statutory liquidity ratio by 50 basis points which of the following is likely to happen a india's gdp growth rate increases drastically b foreign institutional investors may bring more capital into our country c scheduled commercial banks may cut their lending rates d it may drastically reduce the liquidity to the banking system so this is an extreme word drastically so we can't be really sure so they are talking about slr so if the slr is reducing what will happen 
if the slr is reducing then what will happen say current uh, for example the slr is 25% 25% of the deposits should go into slr if it is cut by 50 basis points then it becomes 24.5% so 0.5% of the deposits are freed now this will only be lent so this will go into loans so what will happen as a result the commercial banks may cut their lending rates so answer is c so that's it this question was also asked in pre 2015 so that's it for our discussion. Follow us on all these channels. This is Indumati signing off. Have a good day. Thank you.